You didn't think you could do it, did you? It's a good start. A little bit left. You didn't think you could reach the summit. You gotta keep moving. Let's keep moving. Let's go. You didn't think you could be an Olympian. Try, 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 try. Come on now. There you go. Use your arm. You never thought you could experience the great outdoors. You didn't think you could experience sports ever again. Keep going. Today is a new day. Don't quit on me. Keep going. Your world is now and forever changed because you did it. You are doing it. And you will do the things you love again. You're very bad. You're very bad. If you want to play it, run it, hunt it, swim it, hike it, you've come to the right place. Welcome to Game Changers. It's time to change the game. Oh, man, I love changing the game. And I have been thoroughly enjoying... Uh, the 2024 Paris Olympics and watching all these Olympians. It's been an amazing, I guess you want to call it like a month and a half. And we still have um, more Olympics coming. I mean, we're just about done with the Paralympics. The, I guess, quote unquote, regular (laughs) Olympics just finished up a couple of weeks ago. And all of the stories coming out about these amazing athletes and Olympians have just been so inspiring to me. Uh, my name is Jonathan Price. Thank you for visiting Game Changers and taking a listen. Um, I'm excited today because we're in fall. School has started. Uh, I have been camping and been up in the mountains, and I love the crisp air that you get when you go up into the mountains. And... Right now, as a hunter, I enjoy hearing all the elk bugling. Uh, you see some moose every once in a while. Watch out for the moose. Um, they'll they'll run you right over if you're not paying attention. But it's, it's pretty fun to be out there, especially this time of year. Leaves are starting to change, getting going. But somebody who is very familiar with the mountains and is my guest today, Craig DeMartino. How are you doing, my friend? I'm very good, Jonathan. How are you doing? You sound like you're doing great. I'm, I, I'm, I am doing great, man. It's been a fantastic week and it's, it's been a blessing, you know, just being up. I mean, you're really familiar with the mountains For sure. and we're going to jump into your story here in a second, but, um, what's some of the fun stuff you've been doing over the summer? You know, it's funny as you, you're just talking about moose and, uh, we were just climbing up in Wyoming in this place called Ten Sleep, which is one of our favorite places. And, uh, my wife and I were up there and she, She took our dog for a walk and she ran into two uh, moose, like kind of hanging out together, the two big boys. And uh, she was like, they they didn't care about her. They were just kind of like, yeah, cool. But she was like, they were really big and like super cool looking. Yeah, I think it's funny that people don't really understand just how big a moose is. And if you get a chance, go up to go up to a horse and then put your hand up on its back. And then raise your hands up even higher, and that's just about where a moose is. And then put a and, big um, a big shovel yeah. on either side of his head. Then and yeah, you're Dude, oh my god, like a really, really <laughs> <laughs> a really really big shovel. That's exactly. absolutely right. Uh, well, that's cool. Have you have you guys been following any of the Olympics? We did. We so we watched some of it. I'm I'd, I haven't seen any of the climbing. Uh, obviously, climbing is what is I'm going to be drawn to. But I I didn't see any. Of the yeah. climbing, we actually yeah. watched um, a bunch of the gymnast gymnastic stuff with Simone Biles, and then we watched some of the swimming stuff because that oh, was yeah. kind of interesting. And I don't know anything about those sports, so it's like to me, it just looks I like saw... they're doing black magic. It's just amazing. <laughs> it does some of the flexibility and the. Yeah. I tell you what, it's really cool to see them do the floor routine because they spring so high off the floor that it's just a little unrealistic. And exactly, it, it feels unrealistic. To exactly. me, but I you mentioned climbing, and I saw and I forget the lady's name, but she climbed that wall in like 4.6 seconds. I was oh, like, the speed Holy climbers. smokes! I know it's crazy, yeah. it is. Crazy. I was like, That's not even fair. How did like I, I thought for sure that they just had her on the tether and they were just pulling no, her know. up as fast as that's they possibly what it looks can. Like. I was like, That's a 15 meter wall, too. That's well, it's just like a that's a really tall wall. I don't think people no. understand that. It's like they're covering that terrain in four seconds. That's huge. I know it's insane. Yeah, wild. Well, and it's not just a flat wall either. Yeah, it's, right. you know, got all the cants to it and exactly. You know, these jerks, what do they know? <laughs> they're not athletes. I mean, come on, exactly. Come on. <laughs> 
I can do that in my sleep. Right. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Only in my dreams, I guess. <laughs> well, speaking of climbing, you've you've spent your time on the mountains. You've you've climbed all sorts of insane things. Um, let's start there. Tell me about your your climbing journey. So I started, I've been climbing most of my life. Um, I started right, I graduated college in 1987 and I went uh, to a, a friend of mine was getting married. And so he took us uh, for his bachelor party. He took us climbing and I grew up in Pennsylvania. So I grew up hunting and fishing, but not really doing much outside, like sport wise. I just wasn't okay. a sport kid, you know? Yeah. Um, but this, it was interesting. And, and I thought, oh, this would be kind of fun. I've never done that before. Went climbing on this scrappy little cliff outside Philadelphia, and I just loved it. I loved the movement. I loved being out in the woods. I loved being, you know, at the base of this cliff and trying to figure out the puzzle. And, you know, that was about 34 or five years ago. And I've just, from that day, I was kind of like, I want to keep doing this. And so I just kind of was lucky enough to meet some folks who mentored me and took me under their wing and kind of taught me how to not mess up in the mountains and then uh just kept doing it and doing it and then kind of evolved as a climber and started traveling as a climber and so i was uh in yosemite climbing a bunch out there and then kind of came back Uh to the east and um met my wife my future wife at the point she was i was working in a climbing gym and she's a climber as well she's climbed as long as i have and the owner of the gym actually introduced us and so i was like okay uh we started talking and she ended up, I was moving to Colorado. I was already moving and she, uh, lived in the town that I was moving to. So it was just super weird and, uh, gave me her phone oh. number. Yeah. It worked out super well. Um, gave me her phone number and then we started climbing together once I got to Colorado. Clearly. Exactly. Um, and then after that, I just kind of kept climbing. We ended up having two. we got married, had two kids, um, her and I would climb all over the world together. We would travel with the kids when they were little. And actually, even now, we still do trips together with them when they're available. Um, but we just kind of like built our life around that, about climbing and traveling and just that whole kind of lifestyle that envelops climbing. Um, and then in 2002, I was climbing with a really good friend of mine. So I was climbing at that point about 13 or 14 years and uh, ended up just, mm. you know, getting involved in like this very long, heavy trauma um, just super scary uh, accident that happened to me in 2002. Sure. Um, that kind of, he and I were climbing, um, like in a, in a nutshell, he and I were climbing and I got accidentally dropped from about 100 feet. So that's about a 10-story office building, mm. if you think of it that way. And I landed, I fell yeah. the whole distance of the climb that I had just done. So, you know, 100 feet straight down. And I landed on my feet, oh, which is kind of, super fortunate because as I was falling, I was tipping and, um, I, I hit a tree about 20 feet right. from the ground and the tree stood me back up. So I landed kind of in a standing fashion. Um, that's the good news because you can survive that distance landing on your feet because yeah. the, the shockwave has somewhere to go. But the bad news is then right. it exploded both of my feet, my tibia, my fibular, my ankles, yeah. my heels, um, those oh, all yeah. shattered and kind of came out compound fractures of all that. And then, um, broke my back at L2, just kind of through your belly button ribs on my right side, broke my neck at C5, C6 and tore my right shoulder up the the labrum in my shoulder. And then just kind of crumpled down onto the ground. Um, never hit my head, which is super weird and bizarre to me. Um, and then we started this long, process we were about four miles into the back country so we had to like figure out how to get out um how to get me out obviously i'm not walking and so my partner got right. um yeah partner ca- called 911 and got rocky mountain rescue um activated and those guys a- ended up running this amazing rescue at that point to get me to a hospital because i had severed an artery in my right leg so i was bleeding out really badly and um my friend had put a tourniquet uh-huh. on my leg and it took about seven hours to get me to proper care in Fort Collins, Colorado. And then that just started this long, you know, multi-year journey of trying to heal and, and move forward Mm. and try to figure out who I was as a human being again. Um, because after that much trauma, you know, you have to, you have to like kind of retool everything because you're not the same person anymore. You know, you, you are, you are a very different animal at that point. So, um, 
I did that for like a year. Um, just kind of trying to like sort it out, like, okay, what, what is happening? Um, but my right leg, my right leg just wasn't healing at all. So I was still wearing a cast and wasn't mm. able to like walk out of the cast really. I could kind of stand without the cast on, but I couldn't really do much else. And so, um, that sure. kind of led me to this decision of like, okay, do I want to, what do I want my life to look like? You know, do I want to climb again? Do I want to mm-hmm. be active again? And, and I did, and I couldn't do that with the leg I was on. So 18 months after the original accident, I went back in and amputated my leg uh, below the knee um, so that I could kind of Jeez. get a little bit of, it kind of, it's, it sounds really huge and it, and it really is, it's gigantic, but it actually right. gives you like some power back. You know, you get to make a decision finally instead of the mm-hmm. accident. Um, and then kind of started that trauma cycle again of, of healing and progressing and, um, and then kind of slowly eked my way back into climbing about four or five months after the amputation. Um, and then just kind of kept going on that path and, and it's brought me to where I am today, which is a good place. Yeah, for sure. So you were talking about really that, that trauma and the emotional and physical toll of the recovery when you're going through the decision to come back to climbing, how hard was it to flip that switch in your mind to say, I can get back up on that wall. I can get back up on that mountain. And what did the, I guess, emotional and physical mental gymnastics play in getting back on the mountain? Gymnastics is a good word for it. Um, you know, like when I was in the hospital originally, um, my wife and I were talking and I said, she said, you know, if you, want to climb again, I totally get it. And, uh, and I'll help you and support you. And we'll get through this, you know, however we figure it out. And then she also said, if you don't want to climb mm-hmm. again, I also understand that. And so I'll support that decision as well. Mm. She obviously wanted me to go back to climbing because yeah. that's obviously one of the big things that we do together um, as a couple. But I wasn't yeah. sure. And I just sort of started like, I think more investigating like, okay, who, who, what am I going to do now? Like, who do I want to be? And for me, it kind of like, when you get that injured, you kind of strip everything down to like, okay, what's important to me. And I realized I still loved climbing. I still loved being outside. I still loved being on a cliff and looking up at a cliff and deciding where I was going to climb. And I love that puzzle piece of it and the movement of it all. And so I kind of knew I would go back to it. I just didn't know to what degree. Um, and so we just slowly, kind of started back into it together. And every time I would do it, I would literally swear off climbing every time I went back climbing. I mean, <laughs> every mm. time I would just like, this is yeah. not for me. This is so stressful. And <laughs> I was sure I was going to get right. hurt again. You know, I was like, God, I cannot keep putting myself through this level of trauma. And, um, that kind mm-hmm. of over years, n- no joke, like years of me just kind of doing it slowly it just kind of kept tamping that down and getting it to a manageable level for me. And that, that allowed me to then kind of do bigger and bigger climbs. So it was a multi-year process. It wasn't like, Oh, I'm going to go climbing again. This will be great. It was terrifying. And that, that had to be relearned in my brain and how that all worked. And having my wife, Cindy as a support person and as a person who I could bounce all Mm -hmm. my feelings off of, she was my greatest, you know, um, I guess, Mm kind of like not leading it, but like just kind of helping me facilitate like what this feels like and how some days it was really good. And some days it was really bad. And like being able to kind of dissect all that and understand how that's going to propel me forward or hold me back depending on the day. Um, it was just a, a very long process. So you've walked through this incredible journey and you've you've overcome the physical, the emotional, the mental, and really you've become quite a staple in the climbing community. And I don't know if you necessarily set out to be a staple in the in the climbing <laughs> world and the uh, mountaineering world, but it just kind of happened. And then you joined up with Adaptive Adventures and kind of give me that genesis story and, and why that change and how that all came about. It, so it started when I went out to Yosemite, I had a good friend, um, who does a podcast called the dirtbag diaries. And he reached out to me after the okay. accident. And, and when I started to go back to climbing, he reached out to me and just said, Hey man, I'd love to do a podcast on you. And, um, his name's Fitzgahal. He's very well known in the outdoor industry. 
um, super great guy, like mm-hmm. just a lovely friend. He's been for friends for years. Um, and he said, like, what are you planning on doing? Like, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, I want to go out to Yosemite and kind of redo some of the climbs I had done out there as an able body climber, as a disabled climber, and just see what that feels like. And so he was like, cool, I want to, mm. I want to tag along and see what that looks like. And so he and I worked together. I went out to Yosemite and, um, teamed up with another good friend of mine, Hans Florine. And Hans and I did the first one day ascent of El Cap, uh, El Capitan in Yosemite, mm-hmm. um, which is the largest kind of granite monolith in North America. It's 3000 feet tall. Yep. It's, everybody knows it. It's huge. Yeah. Um, and as a climber, you just, you want to go climb that if you can climb it. So that's Hans like the I, holy grail of it climbing. Is, yeah. It is. It's like the Armeca. It's like, you got to go to the valley and climb yeah. there if you can. So Hans was very like, he's a very nonchalant guy. And he was just like, well, we'll just climb it in a day. Like, <laughs> why not? And I'm like, a lot of reasons why not, man. <laughs> like, uh, okay. Yeah. He seemed confident. So I was like, okay, well, I guess we'll see what happens. And so I went out there and, and, uh, and to be completely honest, I thought I was just going to either get hurt again or die. That was, those were my two options. I wasn't thinking yeah, right. success. I was sure. like, God, dude, I just don't want to get hurt again. Um, but he's such yeah. an amazing partner. And, um, we s- took off on a, on a weekday and we climbed it in about four, about 13, uh, 14 hours that first time. Um, Holy and, smokes. and it's weird. Like I had climbed El Cap before as an able body climber and it took me five days. And so he and I walk up with this completely Ooh. different mindset of like, we're just going to climb this in a day and be home and sleep in our beds. And I was like, this is a very novel idea, but like to put it in practice is very right. different. And so we started up yeah. at six in the morning and, um, I think I, we were back down 14 hours later and we were back, I was in my bed, you know, in whatever it took to wrap the route, you know, but just, you know, you do it all in a day and it's just Good really Lord. bizarre. So he kind of opened my eyes to that. Like you can do these bigger things and it's perfectly safe not perfectly safe, but it is, you can make it as safe. Well, yeah. As you yeah. Can. yeah relative, you know, yes. Exactly. Yes. There's always risk. Um, but he kind of opened my eyes to that and then kind of went back to the Valley a year later with just all disabled people. So typically El Cap was climbed as I had just climbed it with uh, an able-bodied person and then a disabled person. Um, mm. and I just thought it would be cool to do like a all disabled descent. And I tried it once with a good friend of mine, Jerem. Wow. And we failed about 500 feet up. We had some leg issue. Jerem had some leg issues and we had to bail and we bailed. Mm. And then that same trip, I went back and met Hans and we did, um, the nose is the front of El Cap, which is the, when people look at the pictures, mm-hmm. it's the, usually the sun shadow line of El Cap. It's the straightest line. Um, right. so the nose is yep. again, typically done in three to seven days, something like that. And Hans has done wow. the nose, I think, 110 times or something. He has a crazy number. Whoa. Um, I know. And he and I did that route. We did the nose in a day in 13 hours. And he just said at the top, he was like, so you you could do this with all disabled people. You just have to get the right crew and you'll be totally fine. And so yeah. went back the next season and um, with a buddy of mine, Pete Davis and Jerem Fry again. And we did a route called Zodiac on the right side of El Cap. Um, and we just took our mm-hmm. time and we had a film crew with us. It was an amazing experience. We did it, over five days. We climbed Zodiac and it was just a hoot. It was just a blast and, um, wow. came back from that trip and a buddy of mine, I got back to Colorado and a buddy of mine in Boulder, um, had started a nonprofit and he was like, Hey man, I'm going to take these four veterans climbing. They're missing their legs mm. in some form or fashion. Do you want to come down and do that with me. And I was like, no, I have no desire to do that. Why would I do that? Like, I have no <laughs> desire to do that, man. And he was like, well, we're going to do it Saturday. So I'll see you at eight. And I was like, God dang it, dude. And he just hung up on me. So I was like, I guess I'm going to go to Boulder. So I went kind of <laughs> to Boulder and he, uh, his name's Timmy O'Neill and he's a really great friend of ours. And he, um, met up with him and these four guys all younger than me. Um, and they were, just hysterical. And so we climbed all day. They had never climbed before. Um, and they were just the most fun to be around and just their, their love of life, their love of just like not caring about the stuff that, you know, when you go through that much trauma, you, you learn to understand like what's important to you. And these guys really understood that. And so I got a taste of that and I was like, holy crap, I just, this is what I want to be doing. And, um, that kind of started me down the path of like adaptive sports and climbing and how they kind of meld together. And 
I met one of the people from Adaptive Adventures and I met at, at a climbing gym and just, we were chatting and they were, he was talking to me about their organization and what they do. And he's like, you know, we have this climbing program, but it's really small and we'd like to make it bigger. And he said, would you mm. write the job description for us? And I said, yeah, totally. So at that point I had kind of established myself into the climbing community and the outdoor community. So I felt yeah. pretty solid there. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just see where this goes. And I wrote this job description and I said, he said, you know, I sent it to him and he said, what do you think? And I was like, that's a great job. And I, and I jokingly said, I would do that job. And he was like, that's kind of what we were hoping. And so that's how I ended up getting hired. <laughs> <laughs> so he hired me. And so was, much for, so much for writing a resume. If you want the job, <laughs> yeah. just go write the description, just, just write your, write your job. You know, that's a really, <laughs> that's a really interesting way to look at that. That's awesome. I'm going to try that next time. <laughs> just see, it works. Sometimes it works. <laughs> Um, so he was just like, they hired me. Um, and then we just started to build this climbing program together. And then that it started very small and then just kind of kept ballooning out. And what I learned was I work with five outdoor companies and I've worked with them for years, you know, like Arcturex and Evolve mm -hmm. and Black yeah, Diamond yeah. and Friction Labs, um, and Blue Water Ropes. Yeah. And those organizations loved what we were doing in the adaptive space. So it was an easy thing for me to like combine my passions because I love adaptive right. climbing and I love the outdoor industry. So I was able to, with really not much trouble, combine the two of them. Um, and some of those brands have just been so integral in my, my progression in climbing and, and my, what I can do with people in climbing. And so, you know, you have these groups who are just not typically in the, the adaptive space, but they can kind of partner with us at adaptive adventures and kind of build this really cool community that is all over the country. And which is really just a fun yeah. thing to be a part of. That's super cool. Well, I appreciate that story. But now tell me about Adaptive Adventures as a whole, what you guys do. You, you, you mentioned why you guys exist. But tell me some of the programming things that you guys offer and some of the exciting things that are coming down the road. So Adaptive Adventures is really different in a lot of ways. Um, we do eight different sports. Um, we do... Um, I'm obviously just the national climbing manager. So I do just all the climbing with my wife, my wife and I work together. So we oh, do nice. the, we do the climbing program all over the country and Puerto Rico and Hawaii. Um, and what adaptive wow. does is we bring families and people who have gone through heavy trauma. So anyone with a physical disability yeah. and their caregivers can come to our programs free of charge. Um, if they're a veteran, um, if they're a civilian, they come in and just cover the cost of whatever that particular sport is at a discounted rate. But what we want to do is wow. make adaptive sports accessible to anyone. So we, mm -hmm. our whole idea is just get people moving again, because when we see yeah. people do really badly is when they're sedentary, they silo themselves yes. off. They feel like they're the only one doing it. Adaptive adventures kind of builds these communities for people to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And I think there is true power in those communities. Um, cause I see it all the time when we do these events, um, and we have like community nights, we have clinics where we're teaching skills, things like that. So our biking program, our paddling program, our skiing program, they're all like kind of progressive sports. So starting early yeah. on, figure out how it all works and then help. We have people who li like me in each sport who can help you kind of achieve whatever level you want to be. Um, and then that kind of builds into like different things that we do kind of yearly. So uh, my wife and I and the whole team are going to Iowa uh, on Sunday to do like a, there's like an adaptive sports golf tournament for veterans. It's called the T tournament. Oh, cool. And we are going to do the, the different, we're, I think we're at, like alternate activities is what they call us. So we'll have a climbing wall. We'll have um, okay. some bikes there. We'll have some kayaks there. And it just gives people an idea of like, they may have just have never thought they could even do those sports. You know, like if you tell people with no legs, you can be a climber. They're like, can I though? Can I really? Like, and I'm, uh, I'm the person <laughs> right. yes. saying, yes, you know, you can, we can do this together. We'll figure it out. Um, so we have adaptations that make yeah. anyone able to climb or bike or ski or whatever. We can get them doing that mm -hmm. sport that they want to do. And so we do, um, we do these kind of large clinics, like what we're all going to do together, but then we all do kind of clinics all over the country for different organizations. And we work with the veterans affair um, de uh, department. So the department of veterans affairs, sorry. Um, and the VA oh, yeah, kind yeah. of, yep. we're, we get a VA adaptive sport grant with them. So we're able to actually offer programs to veterans and their family and caregivers for free. So any sport we do, they can come and Whoa. do it for free 
and just kind of get into it and have fun. So we do a lot of these. And then what I like to do, like in the climbing community, is I like to kind of push them all together. So the veterans and the civilians, I like to keep them together instead of just we'll oh, do yeah. like one offs. But I love kind of just commingling everything because it's all about that, yes, yes. that community piece at the end. Um, and so, yeah, people can kind of like a lot of our stuff is volunteer based. So we work with a lot of volunteers. So we, we love to get people involved that mm-hmm. way if they're just like curious. Um, and then obviously we have different fundraisers in the fall here kind of going into the colder months. Um, we're doing like a, a, a challenge this coming October, um, like a climbing challenge, a vertical feed challenge. So people can help us fundraise, um, nice. things like that. So we do, we do events all the time. They can always see what we're doing just by going to adaptiveadventures.org. And there's a calendar tab and the calendar will tell you every program, yeah. every state, everything we're doing. So they can kind of plug in wherever they want to. Nice. That's super cool. Have you guys had uh, blind climbers and hikers and mountaineers, all those people? Yeah. So we work with, so Colorado has a really strong um, visually impaired community um, that we get to work with. So yeah. we work a lot with the uh, Colorado School of the Blind. We work with some of their graduates, a lot of their oh, graduates. Yeah. Um, and so when we work with climbing and like people with whatever their sight deal is, um, climbing goes really well with right. them because most of the visual impaired, like even if they have just like a little bit or none or whatever, we work on the clock, um, yeah. the, the chrono, the, the just a circle clock, and we can get them climbing pretty quickly mm-hmm. um, because generally they'll be super physically fit. Um, they're just they're missing the vision piece, so we just kind of bring in a caller, so right. that's a person who's just telling them where the holds are by giving them clock directions. So you know, go to ten, go to two, whatever, right oh, hand cool. to two. And it's really quite amazing when you see someone who is climbing as a blind climber, you see them like when you give them a direction, they follow it to the letter. So if I say go to two o'clock, oh, yeah. and they, they go to two o'clock and then they'll remember. It's really cool to see they'll remember where the handhold was because that's going to become a foothold. So they remember they'll kind of memorize oh, as they're going. Yes. So it's quite cool to see them kind of get on this vertical wall or over whatever it is really long wall. And they just kind of sort out this puzzle just the same way we do. But it's like through this whole another adaptive piece. It's kind of fun to watch. It's kind of interesting when you talk about the adaptive piece, because it doesn't sound like there's a whole lot of adaptability when it, or the need for adaptability when it comes to climbing, because it's a lot of feel. And even though you can't really see where your handhold or your footholds are, um, it's much like grappling. And yeah. in um, karate or, you know, in that sport, it's it's all like physical hand on hand. You're, you're feeling what's going on. And, and that makes one, of you know, climbing such a wonderful sport. I can't climb. I can barely <laughs> roll out of bed without hurting myself. But, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> it is what it is. But a good friend of our show and our organization, Eric Weimer, um, he's been oh, yeah. on the show several times. And Love it's Eric. really fun to have. Oh, yeah, he's fantastic. But it was so funny when I was walking with him a couple years ago and his guide dog, you know, he didn't know the trail, but he he knew climbing so well that, you know, it's it's quite funny when you talk about the blind leading the blind because that's exactly <laughs> what it was. And he was showing people how to hike blind and he didn't need a guide. He didn't even need his dog. He just right. could naturally feel what was going on in the mountain. Well, one of the coolest things that happened to me a couple of years ago was a friend of mine had come out to Colorado and wanted to hike the mountains for the first time. And she had experienced hiking, but in New York, where there weren't like real mountains to, right. to climb or hike. And it was just basic trails and parks and things like that. And when she got up to we went up to uh, Lookout Mountain, and there's some pretty easy trails. There's some interesting little shoot-offs that you can kind of test your skills a little bit. But when she got up there, she realized how much more her sense of hearing and spatial awareness and her body presence in the mountain kind of took effect. Oh, that's cool. And was kind of overwhelming. And she just experienced what the mountain had to offer for the first time. That's cool. And it was it was really cool just to walk with her and to let her kind of walk up and down the trail as she wanted and you know if she wanted to go up this embankment and just try something a little steeper and or go over this uh rock area, you know, this rock field. 
you know, she could. And, you know, she pushed herself and she really enjoyed it. And it's important to get out there and, and, you know, to not be that proverbial, you know, bump on a log and that sedentary lifestyle that you were talking about. It's, it's well, why is that so important for you specifically and then for the community as a whole? I think because what I learned early on after my accident was if I was sedentary, if I wasn't doing anything, I actually hurt more. And so it, it became this mm. self-fulfilling prophecy of like, oh, I feel like crap, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay still. Well, now I feel like more crap. And so when I started kind of doing right. like basic yeah. stuff, like, and I mean like super basic stuff, like hiking, um, whatever it was, um, I realized yeah. like, okay, yes, it, when I'm doing it, it is uncomfortable, but I have to, when I'm done, I feel better. And so, you know, you're getting the joints moving, yes. you're getting everything moving. And then when I started to feel a little bit better, I realized like my quality of life was better. So then you're not in this like self yeah. kind of loathing thing where you're just like, Oh, I feel like crap. I hate how I feel that becomes your reality. And so what I realized was I needed to like change my own narrative and go from like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm a victim in this to, this is horrible to, okay, the, it yeah. happened. I don't want this to define me the rest of my life. And so I want to, mm -hmm. what I kind of, how I handle it and what I do with it. Um, cause you know, we all, everyone's going to have some kind of trauma in their life. No one gets through this with, without getting hit somehow. Um, and I really think it's how right. we react to it. And so for me, I didn't want to be that person who was like, okay, this is horrible. This is, you know, my life sucks. I want it to be Yes, that yeah. happened, but I want to move forward and I want to continue to grow as a human mm. and I want to be a good husband and a good dad and a good friend. And I realized movement helped me do that. And so when I meet people now, it's like it, it is very important for our community and for just as a as a human being here to kind of find community that they can connect with. Um, and sometimes that's your family. Sometimes that's a bigger community like climbing. And I, I've been really fortunate to kind of blend those things together. Um, but I think that you have to find your, your people. And I hear this all mm, the time from yeah. folks. They'll come to an adaptive adventures thing and they'll say, oh my God, I just found my people. Like the adaptive sport people uh, yeah. are my people. And you may not that's have right. wanted to, you know, you, maybe you didn't want to be in that crowd. I didn't want to be in that crowd for sure. But like, once you get there, it's like, oh, okay, I am not the only person going through this. And you meet other people. And it yeah. is a regular perspective builder for me. So I meet so many individuals, yeah. so amazing individuals who are going through some really hard things, but they're able to kind of keep perspective, move forward, and have this really great quality of life, even though on the outside, people looking in are like, oh my gosh, that's so sad. You know, that guy's missing his leg. This guy's missing his arm. This person's blind. It's like- yeah. I feel like sometimes we're the luckiest people in the world because we have that perspective sure. now that people don't always get. And I think that's what the adaptive sport community can bring to people is community. It can give you perspective and it can give you friendship and quality of life. And I think people crave that Absolutely. and need that. And that's uh, adaptive adventures to me is like, that's one of the best things we do is we build those communities. So as we kind of wrap up here, one of the final questions that I always ask my guest is, because we're in this industry and because this is one of the first and only podcasts that specifically focuses on blind sports and the athletes that play them, we're constantly trying to evolve and change what game, whatever it is we're playing. So one, how are you changing the game and what is your charge to people to get out and change the game? I think... I think what I've learned is, is really with climbing specifically is it's, it's, we, we didn't have the tools when we started. So like when I started, there was no like climbing legs. There were no things that I just didn't know other adaptive climbers. It was a very small pool of people. Mm -hmm. So we were able to kind of do really fast pivots all the time. Like, okay, this isn't working. What's working. So I was able to kind of be on the forefront of like technology and, and, helping figure out how things can work as an uh, adaptive climber, specifically yeah. an amputee climber, which is what I am. But I see that boil mm. over into like the blind community because, you know, the use of headsets, the use of different calling techniques, the use of holds, climbing holds yeah. that actually make noise so that they can 
follow to the noise where they're going to climb. Um, there's yeah. all these really cool innovations out there. And I think that that has allowed me to be a part of that wave moving it forward. Um, I think it is incredibly important for people to get involved in whatever it is. So it, it, even if it isn't adaptive climbing, maybe it's bike riding, whatever. I think it's really important to get involved with a community of some kind. So if you're, you know, MS, CP, if you're in a wheelchair, if you're blind, if you're an amputee, there are groups and affinity groups that you can plug into. Um, and that will give you some perspective and it will give you some closure on, okay, where am I now? Where do I want to go? Cause I don't think anyone says I want this traumatic event or this, whatever it is to define me. I think they want to be defined as a human, you know, their humanness. And I think that adaptive adventures does that really, really well. It kind of helps provide these communities that they can grow, be a part of, and then eventually build into like maybe teaching and working together side by side with these other individuals. So it's a very powerful thing. I love that. Well, thank you for, you know, coming on the show. I do want to mention because you've been so kind and so humble that um, you guys need to check out his book uh, after the fall on Amazon. It's it's a pretty powerful book, a, a real honest account of really what Craig has gone through, and it's oh, super you. special. So you can get that on Amazon. Uh, you. you can get that wherever you get your books. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for writing it, man. It's Dude, no, it, thank you. It's very honest that. and very open. Um, if if people want to get a hold of you specifically, or if they have any questions, or about, I know you mentioned the adaptivesports.org, or is it .com? adaptiveadventures.org um they can go there and oh see sorry the, yes yes yeah yeah no worries um they can see the calendar there if they want to reach me directly they can just go craig c-r-a-i-g at adaptiveadventures.org um and that will get them my email okay. that connect them to me directly um if they want to see some like fun adaptive films they can go to my own my personal website which is just craigdemartino.com and we have a couple of the films that we worked on awesome. actually the film of um that first climb with the all adaptive ascent on El Cap is on there. It's a super fun film. And, um, yeah, they can kind of see a wow. couple different things. So good stuff. Well, that, that is super cool. Yeah. I'm going to definitely go check that out. And those links will be in the uh, description in the show notes. Um, but man, thank you so much. And we're going to have to get together and, and go climbing, go hiking, throwback one or two or, you know, something like that. Cause you're in Boulder, right? Uh, Loveland. We live in Loveland. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Well, very cool. Yeah, I'm just down uh, down in Thornton. Oh, right so on. not yeah. too far. No. So it'd be awesome. Yeah, very I would love cool. it. I would love it, man. All right, thank my you. friend. Well, on, be- on behalf of the Aftersight family and friends, thank you guys so much. You guys made the hike, uh, our hike, just an incredible time. And the stories that keep coming out of there are n- nothing short of inspiring. And so keep right them on. coming. We love to hear them. And we're already planning our hike for next year. So hopefully we can get adaptive adventures out there and join us on this amazing hike where we've got, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100 blind hikers up this mountain. It's just, That's it's, rad. So, it's so much fun. That's so, awesome. It's so cool. So on behalf of Aftersight, thank you all for changing the game. 